Hi everyone, Reverend Dorr here from Faith Community Church. Welcome to our online midweek Bible study. This week we're in our final lesson of the book of Ephesians. Now if you missed any of our previous lessons, you can find them on our YouTube channel. This week we're going to be looking at Paul's closing chapter of the book, Ephesians chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, please go to Ephesians the 6th chapter. Now, last week, we left off in chapter 5 with Paul giving very specific instructions on how we should live as followers of Christ, as it pertains particularly to our family relationships. We learned how the union of a husband and a wife serves as an example on earth of the union between Christ and his church. It is a union of love, honor, and submission. Now, the idea of submission here is one of mutual respect for one another for the roles and positions that we have in our home. The husband's position as the head of the wife is like that of Christ as the head of the church. Christ's example for us, beloved, was one of selflessness. He laid down his life for us. Amen. In the same way, a husband is to serve his family with selflessness. Now, a wife is to honor her husband by supporting him in that role. Now, remember, Paul opened chapter 5 and verses 1 and 2, instructing us all to be imitators of God as beloved children and to walk in love in verse 2, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So church, this is the basis for how we are to live both in the church and in our relationships at home and with our fellow neighbors. We are to be imitators of God, imitators of his goodness and his mercy, imitators of his forgiveness towards one another. And we are called to walk in love as Christ loved us. In chapter 6, Paul continues with this same teaching, now giving the Lord's instruction to children. Take a look at Ephesians 6, verse 1. He says here, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Here, children are being instructed to live a life of obedience towards their parents. He cites here the fifth commandment, which tells us in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Now, church, keep in mind, all these instructions in Ephesians are being given to the family unit as a whole. In other words, it's God's intention for the family as well for the entire church for all of the members of that family and church to walk in love as he commanded us to walk. He wants us all walking in love side by side, whether in our homes or in our church. We are called to walk in love, each and every member. Now, in a perfect world, we know this would be wonderful, right? But unfortunately, we're not living in a perfect world. But something we must never forget, someone's disobedience to walk in God's command doesn't exempt me, beloved, from my obedience. I want to say that again. Someone's disobedience to walk in God's command, his command to walk in love, doesn't exempt me from my obedience. So we must seek God's wisdom and grace to help us navigate through difficult relationships without compromising our obedience. Amen. We saw how in chapter 5, right after instructing the wife to submit to her husband, Paul quickly instructs the husband how he is to treat his wife. 
And if you study that chapter, you see the emphasis that Paul puts on the husband to live as Christ has called him to live. Beloved, never forget this. Too much is given, much is required. Men, listen, as the head of your household, you have a great demand upon you to lead your family in a Christ-centered way. In other words, men, you're not to lord it over your wife. You're called to lead her. And you know how? By being a shining example of submission to Christ yourself. Listen, guys, what woman wouldn't want to submit to a husband who loves her as Christ loves the church? So for the sake of your marriage, for the sake of your family, learn what it means to submit to Christ's lordship. Amen? Now here in chapter 6, in the same way, after telling children to obey their parents, Paul puts the focus immediately back onto the head of the household, the fathers. And what does he say to them in verse 4? Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The Amplified Version says it like this. Fathers, do not irritate and provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate them to resentment, but rear them tenderly in the training and discipline and the counsel and admonition of the Lord. In other words, fathers, listen, in raising your kids, imitate Christ. Rule your households in love, not with an iron fist. Don't exasperate your children. Don't overwhelm them, meaning do not put high demands on your kids that they cannot fulfill, but rather raise them up in the reverence and fear of the Lord. You know, as I'm saying this, I am just reminded, the Holy Spirit's reminding me of a, of a, uh, a story in my own life with my, my son, um, one of our children, and, um, you know, he was disobeying. He was our oldest son, Gary. And he was little. He might have been about four years old. So, and he wasn't listening. And and I just, all of a sudden, you know, had come to the end of my rope. And I looked at him and I said, "Gary, you have to change this. You have to change this. This is unacceptable. You can't. You can't be like this. You have to change this behavior." And let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit got a hold of me. I heard the words coming out of my mouth. And as I spoke them, I felt so convicted. Because I felt the Lord say to me this, listen, he said to my heart, do you have the power to change you? Do you have the power to change what needs to be changed in your own power, in your own strength? Do you have that power? And I was so quickened by the Holy Spirit because I realized this was a teaching moment for me. Even though my son was so little, I needed to sow a seed of truth to this kid. And I pulled him back in the room and I said to him, Gary, I want to apologize to you. What mommy just said about you having to change this, I wasn't saying it the right way. What I'm asking you to do is you need to ask Jesus to help you change this behavior inside of you. You need to ask Jesus to help you change. And I felt so right about that moment. It was a God moment between me and my son to not put a demand on him that he couldn't fulfill in his own self. Now, yes, children must learn to obey. But beloved, listen to me. As parents, we're called to raise godly children, not just good children, but godly children. So in every circumstance we have with our kids, in every interaction, we should be looking for ways to point them to Jesus, to point them to the truth. And this was a holy moment for me as a mom to be able to show this little guy that Jesus was his source of change and strength. Amen? 
So we should never put high demands on our kids, but rather we should point them to Jesus and the Word and let the Word of God shape their behavior and let the Word of God, beloved, shape their worldview. In everything you do, imitate Christ. So when you train them and you teach them, imitate Christ. When you discipline them, imitate Christ. Let them see you demonstrate your faith in Christ with a heart of love and humility before the Lord. Now, in verse 5, Paul goes on with his instructions as it pertains to bondservants and masters. He says here, bondservants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. In other words, if you're an employer, (laughs) understand the same God that's over you is the God that's over your employee. And God shows no partiality. We're all equal in the sight of God. Amen? Now, I want you to remember that Paul is giving these instructions after writing for three chapters, beloved, about the many spiritual blessings and riches that we have already received if we are truly in Christ. So it is in light of having received these powerful blessings that we are now shown how we are to live through them. Church, you know, we can live a life of joyous servitude towards our fellow brothers in Christ, towards our spouses, our children, and now, as he instructs, towards our co-workers and employers, because we have been blessed. We have been blessed, beloved, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So it's out of this fullness that we are called to give our lives away. So even if I'm in a family situation that isn't perfect, and most of us are, even if I'm in a job with a boss who is unfair, or I have coworkers that do not like me, I can still choose, beloved, to imitate God, to imitate Christ, and to walk in love because I am in Christ. Blessings involving the Father, Blessings involving the Son, blessings involving the Holy Spirit have been invested already in me if I'm a child of God. And so I need to now, I'm being given instruction through the Holy Spirit in this letter that Paul wrote to Ephesians. I'm being instructed to live out of the overflow of these spiritual blessings. It's a life, beloved, that lives to give rather than living a life that lives to get. Beginning in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6, Paul now gives us an extensive teaching on what he calls here the whole armor of God. The armor of God is what the Bible describes as that which those who are in Christ must put on each and every day. Now, this is so you and I can live armed and ready for the spiritual battles that we will face in this life. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. He says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So Paul tells us here that this armor is specifically for spiritual warfare. 
God gives us this armor, beloved, so we can walk in victory over the attacks of the enemy in our lives. Make no mistake, church. The devil wants to trip you up. He wants to get you off course. He wants to tarnish and mar your testimony in Christ. So what does he do? He throws garbage at you. He throws garbage at you like lies, deception, misbeliefs, false pretenses about yourself and about others. Why? So you can react. So you can disqualify your testimony in Christ. Now, if anyone understood this, the Apostle Paul did. He suffered great persecution in his ministry. So understand, beloved, Paul understood this firsthand. He admonishes all those who are in Christ to be strong. How? In the Lord. Notice it's not about having your own inner strength. It's about having a strength that comes from God himself. It's about being strong in the strength of his might. Amen? Now mark this. This is an armor, beloved, that is only available to those who are in Christ. Because only those who are in Christ have Christ in them. And Paul pulls no punches here. He tells us very clearly, this isn't our armor. This is the armor of God. This is his armor, beloved, that we are called to put on each and every day so that we can be able to stand against the schemes and the attacks of the devil. The apostle Peter warns us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, that the devil roams about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Church, listen to me. God doesn't want you or I to be among the whom. Amen? How many of you know it's a lion's roar that paralyzes his prey? God wants you and I so equipped with his armor each and every day that we can silence that roar. Silence the roar of the enemy when he hurls his accusations against us. Now, when you study this armor, you soon realize that with every piece, you are actually putting on Christ's work for us on the cross. So when we we say we're putting on the armor of God, basically what the scripture is telling us is we are to Put on Christ himself. Put on in remembrance. Put on in faith each and every day what Christ accomplished for us on the cross. Paul continues in verse 12 saying, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, he says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in that evil day. And having done all to stand, stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which in with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert. With all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly, to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. 
Now, as I said, every piece of this armor, beloved, represents a part of the victory that Christ has won for us on the cross. So to put on the armor of God is to put on Christ himself. And we put on this armor every day so that we can stand firm. Stand firm here means to stand ready and be prepared. Prepared for what? For what Paul told us in verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Beloved, Paul is challenging us here, those of us who are in Christ, to see things as they really are. Understand, beloved, if you are in Christ, you are a threat to the kingdom of darkness. In you is a message of hope, a message of deliverance. Church, understand the enemy knows that we're not warring against men, beloved. These are cosmic powers. This speaks of ruling powers of darkness that are operating in this world. Now understand, Jesus in John 17 explained that you and I, if we're in Christ, we're not of this world, but beloved, we are still in it. Amen? Until he takes us home. So whenever you feel harassed or oppressed, you need to look. You need to practice this. You need to look beyond what is happening to you and see where this attack is truly coming from. Church, we're living in a spiritual war zone, a spiritual battlefield, a battlefield in which there is a fight for the souls of men. Whether you're a preacher, an intercessor, or a witness in Christ, you are in this war if you are truly in Christ. There are no exemptions. So Paul is letting us know that we must, we must be prepared for the battles that we will face each and every day. He tells us in verse 14 to stand. In other words, man your post, hold the line, take a stand, maintain the victory already won for you by Christ, and put on beloved truth, fasten it like a belt so that you are firmly fixed in that truth. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the truth. He told us in John 17, God's word is truth. The Bible tells us in the gospel of John that Jesus is the word made flesh who dwelt among us. So Jesus, beloved, is truth personified. He is absolute truth. We are to wear him like a belt each and every day. Church, remind yourself daily, Jesus is the truth. Who he is and what he's done for you. Who he is and what he says about you. This is what we need to wear every single day in our hearts and in our minds to combat the lies that the enemy wants to throw at us. Lies like Jesus won't save you. You're not good enough. How could God love you? How could anybody love you? You might as well give up. You're never going to make it. Church, listen, when those lies come that make you feel less than, less than all God promised you to be, that's when we must remember the word of truth. And listen to me, unless you know it, you're not going to remember it. The Holy Spirit 
is the teacher of the church, the Bible says, right? Well, when you're in the exams of life and you're being tested, that's not the time you open the book. That's the time you pull up what you already know in order to pass the test. Amen? So the Holy Spirit on the battlefield, beloved, as your teacher is going to bring back, the Bible says, to your remembrance, the things you studied. But you must study them. We must be committed students of the word of God if we're going to make it in this life. When those attacks came, Paul goes on to tell us he would put on the breastplate of righteousness. He's telling us, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Beloved, God has given us through his son, his righteousness to wear like a breastplate. What does a breastplate do? It protects your heart. It protects your heart from condemnation in the spirit realm. Understand, this is not a righteousness from ourselves because the Bible tells us our righteousness is like filthy rags. No, church, this is a righteousness credited toward us upon salvation when Christ is in us and we are in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 tells us, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In verse 15 of Ephesians 6, Paul writes, we must wear the peace of our salvation like shoes on our feet. Having, having rather the, that covenant of peace with God, beloved, through the gospel secures us. It anchors us. We have been given through Christ a covenant of peace with God. Church, listen, we must be grounded in the truth of the gospel. We must be grounded in the truth that he saves to the uttermost, meaning completely and forever, those who are in Christ, so that we don't get knocked down when the enemy strikes, when he starts hurling his accusations against us. That breastplate of righteousness must be secured, protecting our heart so that we don't get deceived, thinking we're somebody we're not. Because as Paul began this letter, we know we have already been blessed with spiritual blessings in heavenly places. When we have these shoes, when our feet are shod with these shoes that they call the, the gospel of peace. These shoes, beloved, help anchor us. They secure us so we don't get knocked down. How do you get there, beloved? You've got to preach the gospel to yourself each and every day. Take an element of the gospel, the element of God's story through his son, and put it to memory so that you can recall it. Preach the gospel to yourself each and every day. That's how we wear these shoes on the defense. But church, understand something. We also wear these shoes on the offense. Our feet must always be ready to go wherever the Lord calls us to go in order to share his good news. Amen. Paul tells us in verse 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Remember, Paul is writing this letter from a prison in Rome. He was surrounded by imagery of Roman battle gear. It was everywhere. The battle shields that Roman soldiers used was as large as a door. And it provided full coverage for every soldier from head to toe on that battlefield. Church, the Bible's telling us our faith in Christ covers us 
like a shield. He specifically says in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. In other words, he's letting us know, don't leave home without it. Amen? Church, we are to take up, carry with us the shield of faith everywhere we go to quench the flaming arrows that the enemy tries to throw at us. He says in verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. In other words, beloved, Paul is saying, along with your shield of faith that covers your entire being, your outer being, take up the helmet of salvation. Now, a helmet, beloved, not only protects your skull and your outer head, but it's protecting your brain. Paul is saying, use this armor, the armor of God, to protect your thought life. Don't allow the enemy to hijack what you think. Church, be aware of your thoughts. Be aware of the thoughts that you dwell on. Make sure that they line up with the truth of your salvation, who God is and who you are in him. Don't give the enemy a stronghold, beloved, in your mind. We do this by taking up the next piece of armor, take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Paul says. We take up the word of God when we believe it and speak it. We believe and speak God's word, church, offensively to declare what he has already given to us. And we speak it, believe it, defensively in order to take back whatever the enemy has stolen from us. Church, listen, we're to use this sword as a weapon in prayer. In verse 28, Paul says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now Paul closes his letter with these final greetings, verse 21. So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, which we read about in a previous study, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Amen. Oh, what a powerful, encouraging close to a powerful, encouraging letter. A letter written from the Apostle Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit while he was serving time in prison for the sake of the gospel. Beloved, I trust you were blessed through this study. Please leave a comment. Let us know how the book of Ephesians, the study of the book, has impacted your life, your faith, your walk with Christ. And I pray as a result of this study, beloved, you are more hungry and more thirsty to dig into God's word each and every day. We are called, beloved, to be people of the book, people of the Holy Bible, to know it, to believe it, to do it, and to share it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us through this study, Lord. 
Thank you for the guidance of your spirit, illuminating these truths to our hearts. And we stand on the promise that you've given us in the Holy Spirit as the teacher of the church. He will bring back to our remembrance the things that we have learned. So help us, Lord, as we continue digging into your word, growing in the knowledge of your truth, that we, Lord God, would have your word ready on our lips in every circumstance, coming out of the abundance of our heart to minister life, to minister healing, to minister deliverance to all that we meet. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you, beloved. Have a great week. Thank you for joining us this week as we study God's Word together. For those of you watching on YouTube, please subscribe and don't forget to hit the like button. I want to encourage those of you who haven't done so already, please join us on our official online church platform. There you can watch our weekly messages when they go live, as well as connect with our church family. Also, don't forget to check out our website at faithcc.com where you can receive additional messages and see our upcoming services. At this time, I want to thank all of you who have been supporting our church and ministry with your financial giving. Guys, you are a blessing to us. Together, we are able to fulfill our mission, which is to transform individuals and families through the gospel into empowered followers of Christ. If you would like to give now, please follow the prompts on your screen. At this time, once again, I want to thank you all for being here. And I want us all to remember, church, as we go through this week, that together we are living truth, changing lives, and loving God. God bless you.